Hey Jack, first one on, always ask the, the best questions. Sierra, good to see you. Uh, material guy, um, Emily, all the, all the regulars, good to see everybody. Glad that you're on here. Um, thank you all for joining us. We, we have a really great guest today. It's Mike Stevens, um, who's a good personal friend of mine and um, just great human being, lives in Springfield, Missouri. And I, I've realized that as we have been doing these Instagram lives, talking to people about um, you know their personal response to coronavirus. We've talked to emergency room doctors in New York. We've talked to epidemiologists in Houston. We've talked to public health experts in Minnesota um, and many other cities, uh, elected officials, uh, including Clay Jenkins, the county judge of Dallas County, who was the first in Texas to um, implement a shelter in place policy. Really tough decision, but I think it galvanized the state and ultimately forced the governor to do something very similar. We've gone to a different city every single day, Dallas, Houston, New York, Minneapolis, El Paso yesterday with the incomparable Jim Ward. And today we're going to be going to Springfield, Missouri to talk to Mike Stevens. He is the proprietor of an independent movie house there that obviously is unable to show movies in person to their customers. I'm going to talk to him about how their business model changes, get him to um, give us a, a list of movies that we should see since he's in the business. And since all of us are spending a lot more time at home with the ability to stream movies. And uh, we'll also have a beer with him because it's Friday. And on Friday, uh, we'll have beers on the Instagram live show. Um, so thank you all for joining us. A um, couple of thoughts uh, before I, I ask Mike to, to come on. Uh, Amy and I worked a nice long shift starting at 8 a.m. this morning at the El Paso Food Bank, which is called El Pasoans Fighting Hunger. And if you want to find out more about El Pasoans Fighting Hunger, if you live in the El Paso metro area and you would also like to volunteer, if you'd like to make a donation to a food bank that could use the help and has to buy the food that is distributed to a community of more than a million people, um, nearly 200,000 of whom are regularly food insecure. And now with record unemployment, restaurants, movie theaters, and small businesses closing down, uh, you're seeing lines that stretch for miles for people to come and get food. If you wanna make a financial contribution, it's elpasoansfightinghunger.org. And you can make a donation, you can sign up to volunteer. Anyhow, Amy and I spent a good part of the day at the El Paso Food Bank, uh, initially uh, building boxes, you know, putting the stuff in boxes that would be handed out, breaking down excess cardboard, helping to clean up the warehouse. And then we moved out onto the line that actually distributes the food. And literally, you could not see the end of that line. It, it stretched um, further than, than the eye could see, uh, miles long, people who I would assume, you know, the line starts moving around 9 a.m., I would assume they got in that line hours earlier, you know, maybe at 5 a.m., 4 a.m., they're already in line and coming back through. And folks from every walk of life, every background, every kind of car, um, we loaded um, watermelon, we loaded mangoes, we loaded bread, we loaded cookies, uh, we loaded rice, we loaded beans, we loaded um, everything that you could think of. And every car that would come up, there'd be a little sticker on the window and it would have uh, the number one or two or three or four on it. That's the number of families that the driver of that car is picking up for. And that would determine how many boxes of food that you would try to place into the car. And so I was in this line with Amy and with other volunteers and some um, paid staff from the Workforce Commission, uh, young people who are un unable to get a job otherwise have been um, assigned a job here at the food bank. All amazing people, all helping their fellow El Pasoans uh, eat right now at this very desperate moment for so many. So um, really fulfilling to be able to be part of that. And also, I got to tell you, having been cooped up in this house for so many days in a row, nice to get out and to see other people and to share a kind word with somebody who's pulling up in their car or their truck or to, you know, 
small talk with the other folks who are uh, packing the food into those cars. Really amazing experience. I cannot wait to go back again. This is the third time that we volunteered in the last two weeks. Uh, we'll be going back more regularly now. Again, um, would urge you to sign up if you haven't already for a shift for the food bank in your community. We were kept six feet apart from all other volunteers. We wore gloves. We wore a mask on our face. My temperature was checked before I went in. If I'd had a temperature, they would not have allowed me to work with other volunteers. So they're taking the necessary precautions to keep us and those whom we are serving safe. Um, and it's desperately needed right now. And, and this, y además, in addition, typically those who volunteer, at least in the El Paso Food Bank, are senior citizens. And these are precisely the people who should not be volunteering right now, should not be leaving their home. They are, by definition, a vulnerable population. We cannot expose them or run the risk of exposing them to COVID-19. So they need more people, not just because of the surge in demand, for those who are now newly food insecure, but because their old cohort of volunteers are no longer able to show up. So again, please uh, volunteer at your food bank. You can go to Feeding America, uh, which is the National Clearinghouse. You can go to Feeding Texas in our state. And if you're in El Paso, you can go to El Pasoans Fighting Hunger. Um, last bit of personal news. Um, as you know, Amy and I are also homeschooling our kids right now. Um, they're also distance learning with their schools, which has reduced the demand on us to come up with curriculum and material and lessons. Um, although I still have music class and I'm very happy to announce that Henry can now play the first part of Blitzkrieg Bop, um, which we are gonna learn the whole song through. And at some point would love to bring them on to the Instagram live show to play for you all. Um, now, I wanna do a quick update on, on some of the numbers. Um, we've talked about everyone who's got a microphone and a voice should be programming the truth and the facts right now, since you've got this daily press conference from the White House that traffics in lies and misinformation and the stuff that's just not reliable for us. So let me give you the, the latest numbers that I have. Uh, global cases of coronavirus have topped a million. We have nearly 60,000 deaths worldwide. In the United States, you have 267,000 cases, almost 7,000 people, 7,000 human beings, 7,000 of our fellow Americans have lost their lives. And as you see, there are only 141,000 tests that have been conducted. Now, I asked Elizabeth, who helps um, source this information from the Centers for Disease Control for me, how can we have more cases and we have tests? It's because doctors are reporting presumptive cases of coronavirus, and it's because we do not have enough tests in this country. Months after we first learned about coronavirus, or the president first learned about coronavirus, weeks after it became an epidemic in this country, we still don't have enough tests. And those numbers that I'm showing you right now, 267,000 cases, um, you know, almost 7,000, uh, you know, 6,800 deaths, those are, are really directionally correct, and, and that's about it. Uh, we know that far more people uh, have coronavirus, far more people have died than is reported so far because we do not have the tests. And we also have a logjam in reporting coronavirus-related deaths. We learned that firsthand from an emergency room doctor that we listened to uh, at the start of the week, uh, emergency room doctor in New York, who talked about being on the phone for an hour after one of his patients had passed from coronavirus, unable to report the case, just hung up the phone and got back to caring for people. So this number is only relevant as um, a relative number to what we've been reporting every single day as we see these continue to go up. In Texas, uh, 5,500 cases, 93 deaths. And again, you can see a uh, very low number of tests, 50,000 tests. Let me show you this, um, which helps to put this in a little bit of perspective. Um, if you're as old as I am, you, you can make no sense of this graph that I'm posting on here. So let me just interpret it for you. The yellow line is all these lines show um, the number of coronavirus deaths over time. The yellow line is China, the, the longest line that you see there. South Korea is the line at the very bottom, the, the green line. Italy is that black line that's kind of topping out, it's plateauing. 
what you may or may not be able to see, and I'll get a blow up of this for the next time that we produce this graph. It's from the Financial Times, by the way, uh, is that the United States and the United Kingdom are still arcing up. Not only have we not flattened the curve, we have yet to reach a peak and we are outpacing every other single country on the face of the planet for the number of coronavirus cases and deaths after the first reported case. Um, information that you should have. These are things that we should know about just how bad this is right now. And it only underscores the importance of staying at home, not leaving your house, except for going to the grocery store where you should keep more than six feet distance from everyone there, especially the brave grocery store workers who are stocking the shelves and ringing up your purchase and the other customers who are there. Or if you have one of those important jobs that causes you to have to go to work. You're a healthcare worker. You work in the grocery store. You are in one of those restaurants that's still open preparing takeout meals. Uh, if we really care for all those people and we really want to give them our thanks, the best way to do that is to stay at home so we don't run the risk of infecting them or putting additional pressure on our healthcare system. That is our, our public service message for the day. Last thing before I, I bring on Mike, a couple of things you should know from a policy perspective here in Texas, though we are grateful that Governor Abbott has implemented something akin to a shelter in place order, really following the lead or maybe forced into doing this by County Judge Clay Jenkins in Dallas, Texas, who was the first major metro county to do this. Very tough decision, bit the bullet, did the right thing, undoubtedly saved lives in that community. The other metro counties did it as well. Our thanks to County Judge Samaniego, Mayor Margo here in El Paso for doing that as well a few days later. Uh, though we have a statewide stay-at-home-ish order in place, uh, gun stores are exempted. And I've heard back from a lot of people who are concerned about the fact that now that you have people confined at home, now that you probably have rising rates of depression, and somebody can quantify this uh, for me. Uh, now that you have concern about increased domestic abuse, this is the wrong time to say that gun stores and ammunition are exempt and that you should stock up on, on these two things. Um, I don't know that we need that, any more of that, um, in, in our homes, in our lives right now, especially if, if the order and the public health advice is to stay at home. Uh, at, at the same time, Governor Abbott signed an executive order stopping all abortions, all reproductive rights in the state of Texas. Um, so try, try to balance those two in your head, why, why one is essential and the other is not. And then lastly, he, he also exempted churches, which I think is perhaps one of the most dangerous things that he could have done, sending the message that it is okay for people to congregate in close quarters in large numbers going forward, which is exactly the way that you spread coronavirus. Um, so a couple of things that you should know about that are happening here in Texas. If you'd like to see a change, reach out to the governor, reach out to your state rep, and then even uh, as importantly, or maybe more so, make sure that you're registered to vote, make sure everyone in your life is registered to vote, and make sure that you plan to vote in November so that we have leaders and those who represent us that truly reflect our interests and the most urgent issues before us in this state and in this country. All right, I have a, a text from Cynthia that says I'm talking too much. Um, I hear you, Cynthia. Let me see if I can get Mike on. All right, here we go, Mike. All right, he's first on the list. Requested to be on. All right, Mike. Hey. How are you? Cynthia got my back. Yeah. <laughs> she was like, enough of you, Betsy. I want to hear from Mike. More Mike in the mix. More Mike in the mix. You know who's also watching is uh, Lisa Delantoni. Oh, no. Yes. Who was very hurt that you are on the Beto Instagram daily 4.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time show before she is on the show. Well, so. Got to put in the time, and Lisa. That's all I'll say. Um, how are you? I'm well. Yeah, yeah. The girls are uh, downstairs sequestered, and, and I, I just cracked a beer, so I'm, I'm, I'm good on a Friday afternoon. 
I, I did too. Um, and I'll, I'll cheers you. Uh, here's to you. Friday beer. So, yeah. What is the what is the routine in the Stevens home on a weekday? Um, these days, you know, I can, the new reality. It's uh, I get up pretty early and I go down. So I run uh, a the Moxie Cinema in Springfield, Missouri, and I go down early. I'm the only staffer that can go to the theater anymore, and I just check in on things and work for about until about twelve thirty or one, and then I come home and we swap out and I start doing. Um, homeschooling stuff with the, our two daughters, Saskia and Fiona. It, it, in some ways, it's got to be nice to, to get out of the house, that you have the ability to do that. Neither yeah, Amy I really, or I can do that right now. Right. I, I, I feel for, I mean, thinking back to New York days when um, living in a, in a pretty small apartment, uh, that, would be, that would be very hard, a small apartment. We live in a house now, so that's not so rough, but like just having someplace else where you just, that's what you're there to do and be there and, and focus on that and then come and then be done with it and go to another place is, it's a, it's a big luxury for sure. And so in your work household, we were doing full on homeschooling until this week, the El Paso Independent School District implemented kind of a distance learning uh, program, which we supplement with some additional homeschooling. What's it like for your kids? Is the school district in Springfield providing instruction or are you all responsible for that? So they they benefited from spring break hitting at the time when like the, the new reality kind of hit. Um, so that was the, what, the 14th they, they started on spring break. And so they had the, the, the school district had a whole week to kind of figure out what to do next. And there was one week of they were that when they came back from spring break where they delayed school and they said, we're, we're not going to open it up. And we were in charge of, of our own schooling for one week. And this week is when they kicked in that distance, distance learning kind of a very, like just a check in in the morning from the homeroom teachers. And then some, some workbooks that they sent us with two weeks of lesson plans, just enough structure that you feel like uh, it, it really helps a little bit. Is it on Zoom, the, the check-in, or is it by phone? Uh, it is on a some kind of, like, proprietary Spring, Springfield Public Schools software through Canvas. So I, I don't think it's, it's quite as uh, as hackable as Zoom, as we discussed. I, I sent Mike, uh, my son Ulysses, recorded uh, a Zoom bomb. Uh, with Mike, Mike uh, introduced me to that phrase, but um, a guy came into his classes – zoom and um just started doing all crazy stuff including taking off his clothes uh par partially uh and uh i didn't know that that was a thing but that's apparently a big thing people hack into zoom conference calls and then i also was reading a story today they also find archived zoom calls and then and then download them and share them so um gotta gotta be careful about that uh henry our youngest was on a zoom call with his third grade class it was really funny. The teacher at one point said, okay, class, are, are you guys paying attention? And one of the kids said, uh, kind of, uh, which I thought was really awesome and honest uh, in a way that a third grader is, is honest. Um, so talk about, you, you mentioned that you run the Moxie Cinema in uh, Moxie Theater in uh, Springfield. What, what does that mean to your business that you can literally no longer screen movies in person for people? Are you able, are you guys still open? Are you still in business? Do you still have employees? Um, how do you engage with your customers? And if you can still screen movies in some way, how do you do that? Yeah, it's, so we closed on March 16th um, before there was any stay at home order, well before that, but but pretty much exactly when the CDC gave us the, the part, um, groups of 50 uh, or more should not be allowed. Our, our biggest theater seats 84 and that seemed like a natural, like it was already kind of coming and, and we needed to, and I was starting to be concerned about our staff as well as obviously customers. Um, so after that, we closed on the 16th. And what I found fascinating was that by that Friday, traditionally theaters open movies on Friday. And by that Friday, uh, some smaller film distributors had shifted completely and created a new, a whole new market where they basically would give us specific URLs. Like the Moxie has a specific 
web page that's a virtual screening room and they go to that and and they click on a screening and we get a, per, a percentage of the ticket sales that people would pay to see that movie for you know to rent it for two or three days they pay ten dollars twelve dollars to rent it and we we would get six dollars of that so the idea of like revenue completely dropping off the cliff we, we have the luxury of that not of that have happened yet and um and we we uh i just had payday today we had our fully staffed up till today and then um we are investigating what the you know payroll protection um is going to offer us as far as loans small business administration stuff uh but most likely a lot of our staffers they're they're just part-time um and they will be filing and then we we hope to make it through uh this this until the other side and then you know we're, we can't wait to hire them again and, and open our doors. But what that's going to look like is, I mean, we're all wondering, right? So I was going to ask you that you don't then know what this $2 trillion bill passed by Congress signed by the president means for your small business and your employees yet. Yeah, you're, you're still going to, you're still trying to figure that out. A little bit. I mean, we applied for the PPE um, loan and, and, but it, it like, Literally, it, the portal opened for small businesses this morning, and our banker was saying yesterday that you need to do this immediately because it's going to get overwhelmed. So we're still trying to figure out, does this make sense to make a loan with these certain requirements attached to it? Uh, but we went ahead and did it um, because it was an opportunity that we thought was going to disappear if we didn't act. But, yeah, I, I, obviously things are moving really quick in that area, which is great because you can't resuscitate something once it's, <laughs> once it's dead. And so as far as small businesses go, it was nice to see that kind of, for Congress, relatively quick. But I can only imagine it's going to be a complete nightmare to administrate. Yeah, and I've got to think that a big part of your revenue beyond ticket sales was uh, concessions, uh, beer, wine, popcorn, whatever else you all sell. And obviously, you can't make that up right now. I was talking to Jim Ward yesterday, who has a restaurant, Eloise, in El Paso, and he shared with us that in Texas now, you're not only able to deliver food, which his restaurant does, but they've eased the alcohol laws to allow you to, to deliver alcohol. So you could order uh, a sandwich and a six pack or a sandwich and a, I guess a mixed drink and have that brought to you. I don't know if that is an option in Springfield, if you want to get into that kind of business, but you could say, um, hey, we're going to be screening this movie virtually, um, order your stuff and I'll deliver it to your house. I, I guess you'd have to place a really big order for that to be economically worthwhile to you guys. Yeah, we don't have really, we're not set up to be that kind of operation, but a lot of places in town are, and I have noticed, I couldn't, I didn't know if it was loosening of the local regulations, but I have noticed a similar thing where people are making, at the very least, like our, my favorite cocktail bar in town is uh, called the Golden Girl Rum Club, and they're, they're offering, at the very least, mixers. So like the kind of really great mixers to go. Wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. What happens at the Golden Girl Rum Club? Just tiki's. It's a tiki bar. <laughs> yeah, that's great. It's on the and that's your favorite downtown. place? Yeah, it's dynamite. Yeah. I like I'll, that. I'll bring you next time you come. Hey, do you remember Amy? I, 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 your wife? Yeah. yeah. Um, she just walked in the walked into the studio. Hey, Mike. Good to see you. Good to see you. Next time we go to to Springfield, Mike has uh, a place he wants to take us to. Yeah, that's what's making fun of you. Yeah. For liking a tiki bar. I, I'm not making fun of you. I just I just find it's that. like. I just find that. Is he making fun of me? I think he's always making fun of you, Mike. That's not true. That's definitely not. <laughs> hey, so l let me ask you this. Um, I I happen to be a member of the Moxie uh, Premium yeah. Club. Uh, best hundred dollars I've ever spent. And uh, yeah. not only do I get uh, Thank you free support. entry when I'm in Springfield, not only do I get popcorn and, and a drink, but I'm on your newsletter. And not this last letter, but the previous one, um, you were offering a screening of Once Were Brothers, which is about Robbie Robertson and the band. Mm -hmm. um, so before I plunk down my 12 bucks, which is what I think it cost me to, to stream it, tell, tell us about the movie. And then I'm going to ask you if you want to start thinking about it. Since we're all home, or most yeah, of yeah. us are, and we have some time on our hands, what else should we be watching that you've had a chance to screen and, and check out? But start with Once We're Brothers. And somebody, people make fun of me for the six-part questions. That was only a three-part question. 
Um, so start with Once We're Brothers, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, so this is a new documentary. It was in theatrical release, meaning like it was not available to stream anywhere. And we played it at the theater. It did very well. Springfield's a big music town, and it's about um, – it's kind of told from the perspective of Robbie Robertson. So it's a documentary about. Hi. Hey, Molly, what's going on? Did you bring cockroach in my toilet paper? No, I didn't. Like like a plastic one? I don't know, because there's a cockroach in my toilet paper. Oh, you know, so there, there's some uh, April Fool's leftover jokes. I put a snake, uh, a rubber snake in the bed uh, that Amy woke up to, and then Molly just found a cockroach. Uh, in her bathroom, but she's not sure if it's a real cockroach no, or. Oh, so sorry for the interruption. Oh no, no, Molly, this great. is this is important. It. This is important. What he's doing right now. Yeah, this is really important, Molly. This is really um, important. So, so this is in theatrical release. You can now stream it through the Moxie. Right. Um, the movie is. Is it about Robbie Robertson? Is it about the band? Is it? Yeah. Can can one be and not the other? It was, well, that's good. That's a, I don't think we have enough time to unpack that, that today, that's out, but yeah, it's pretty much Robbie Robertson's take on the band, which like, if you're a fan of the band, you're going to love it. Like, uh, but, but there's some criticism that maybe uh, it's too much his take, but I mean, yeah. he's, he's Robbie Robertson. So I'm, I'm not Le gonna... Levon Helm is gone. So he can't. Yeah, he I know. That's what he Last man standing tells the history. Yeah. Um, where, where does Robbie Robertson rank in the pantheon of rock and roll gods in your universe? Uh, like 38. Okay. It's very precise. What do you think, Amy? What do you think? I'm probably Runway more on mine, but yeah. Well, who's Runway number 20, one? 59. Oh, it's, it's a moving target. Yeah. Dolly Parton. Oh, Dolly Luke. Parton. She's reading uh, bedtime stories. I heard. I love that. Yeah. Um, what else should we be watching? What have you seen recently, uh, or what did you see 10 years yeah, ago? One of the uh, things that we, we did recently was kind of look, thinking of people uh, being at home and kind of offering our recommendations on the streaming services. And all of these are available either Amazon Prime or Netflix. I think they're largely on Netflix. Um, but Howard's In, the Merchant Ivory production, like as far as just kind of period piece, like you're, you're not going to not going to be too heavy, fun, enjoyable. Um, there's also a great, if you guys didn't see this, Hell or High Water. Oh, uh, tell us who's in that. I think we did see it. Uh, well, Jeff Bridges is in it. And then there's two younger actors that aren't as Chris. Takes place in Texas. Chris they, need to make, they need to make the mortgage on their ranch. Exactly. Yeah, you yeah. saw it. It's, that's, it's a really good movie. Really tense, kind of spare thriller. And then uh, The Little Hours, which is a kind of a black comedy uh, with Aubrey Plaza, very raunchy, and uh, she is a nun in that. The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, which is the Coen Brothers movie. We started that, we started yeah, that yeah. one. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's serial. Like you can you can take it in small doses, so that's yeah. good. Yeah. Um, as far as beautiful movies, that even if you don't think you're a martial arts fan, there's a beautiful um, movie called Shadow, which is uh, kind of a Chinese production from two years ago that's on Netflix. There's a really great romance called Blue Jay, which is one of the Duplass brothers, Mark Duplass. It, um, I almost called him a Texan. I mean, he is like Mark and Jay went to UT Austin. So like they're, they're Texans. That's Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, so uh, Mark is in that. It's a really great kind of indie romance. Um, and then a weird kind of offbeat one would be uh, Popeye with uh, Robert Altman's version of Popeye with... Um, the guy, uh, so it's Robin Williams as Popeye, and then, and it was a total. Oh, yeah. It was a this this was like 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And the guy. I saw that. Harry, My dad walked out of it. <laughs> I believe it. I believe yeah. it. Harry yeah. Nielsen did the soundtrack. Really? Yeah. John yeah. Lennon's good buddy. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, the fellow Lost Weekend. Um, so the other thing that I thought people might not be aware of, but if you go to National Theatre Live, so like uh, the National Theatre in the UK, they, uh, they have a lot of state funding for the arts, obviously, in Europe. And one of the things they've done is to try to democratize theatre. They have um, filmed productions uh, at the National Theatre and, and at, very other, at various other halls in London. 
and then put them in cinemas and, and theaters around England. And some of those have since come over to America. And we, at the Moxie and all over uh, the US, there's national theater live productions that are screened, you know, like whether it's opera, ballet, but usually a lot of, of stage work. And one of the great ones, James Corden is in this, and it's one man, two governors. And they are offering that NT Live on YouTube now for free. They just announced that like yesterday. And it's, cool. I watched like 50 minutes. I, I've seen it once and I, I watched 50 minutes of it this morning kind of to give myself a break. And it was super funny, very kinetic physical humor as well as kind of sharp wordplay. And just fun seeing a theater production um, kind of to mix things up. So those, those cool. are my recommendations. I love it. Let, let me do this. So if you've got a question for Mike Stevens, um, you have a question about Missouri, Springfield, um, Robbie Robertson, uh, a movie theater, or a specific movie that you have not seen yet, you've heard about and you want his opinion on it, there's a little um, down there is a little question button and you hit that and you can ask the question. But let me try this uh, experiment. Um, Everyone uh, who's who's watching, put the the last movie that you saw right now, um, and and then Mike Stevens is just gonna rapid fire opine on these. So, <laughs> last movie that you saw, I'm gonna. What's the last movie we oh. saw? Oh, there's somebody who asked about their favorite play, and the National Theater Live did a production of Peter Pan, which I saw with my girls, and it was amazing. It was so good. The Joker is better than you would expect. And like, I feel like the Joker got a terrible rap uh, and it's it's a kind of a very arty multiplex movie. Beto's a hot silver fox, also a great one. I mean, I don't remember that. Should, should I watch The Shape of Water? It seemed weird. Yeah, it's weird. It's very, it's an unbelievable movie to have gotten as big as it has. Guillermo del Toro is great. It's a really good movie, but it's a, it's a weird movie for sure. Okay. Did you guys 1917. Cynthia, you should totally see 1917. It's really uh, just, it will take you on a ride and you're kind of watching it all happen and, and spill out. I did not see the last Jumanji movie, unfortunately. Yes. What, uh, so here's a question from Rose. Have you listened to The Weeknd's new album? No, I, I, I heard about it. I've, I've read some mixed reviews. People were saying maybe it's uh, two party oriented, which to me sounds like actually uh, great right now. <laughs> like, give me give me less uh, depression, more party. That's right. What's your favorite part about being a movie theater owner? Asked Jack. Uh, probably being able to pick the movies and kind of decide like this is something that Springfield should see. I think this is an important movie that speaks to the moment or moves the art form forward in one way or another. Uh, kind of being a curator of one one form or another. Tell us about Jojo Rabbit. Um, Ripley Chase is asking. Uh, I, I've seen it and I I loved it and I didn't expect to, and I went in conflicted. Like, can I watch a movie that in any way trivializes Nazis, the Third Reich, any of that stuff? And and it and it did not do that. And the movie was much different than the previews in a much better way. And I love that the previews did not give away. The, the course of that movie took. What what was your take on it? Well, I had the benefit of seeing it before a lot of reviews were out. I saw it in Toronto at the Toronto uh, International <laughs> Film Festival. So kind of, I saw it with the critics that were then writing reviews. And there was a lot of um, immediate blowback to saying like, you cannot um, make light of this. And uh, this obviously this tragedy should never be playing for comedy in any form or another, but it's, it was an incredibly well done movie. I mean, like it, it didn't reckon with the full scope of the Holocaust, nor did it aspire to do that. It was a uh, incredibly um, like just what I was impressed with from directing is the ability to shift tones completely to go from like absolute pathos or, or joy to like really dark, um, serious things and then shift back, back somehow. Um, the performances were great. Uh, so like, I I was on this uh, side of like, this is a crowd pleasing movie that tackles serious subjects in a really interesting and new way. And it was directed fan in a fantastic way by somebody who's Jewish. Um, so I, I, I was glad to have shown it and, and it did well. Um, here's a question from Jack and, and Jack, by the way, Mike, you might not know this because you may not regularly tune in, always asked 
such great, insightful questions. And if this ever becomes a thing, you know, and I become the, the Johnny Carson of Instagram Live, mm -hmm. um, Jack is going to be the heir apparent, or he's going to be the guy who, who guest hosts the show right. from time to time. <laughs> so he has a really good question. Are movies set for release going to be automatically released digitally for purchase? So we're not doing in-theater releases anymore. What happens to your industry, at least in the foreseeable future? And for example, movies that were going to come out in May, June, July, August, are they just going to go direct to digital? Uh, I think the big studios are figuring that out right now. The, the, the ones that have happened so far, we had Invisible Man, Emma, and The Hunt were going to be released theatrically or were in theatrical release, and they immediately went to video on demand when it became apparent that theaters closed or, or the big chains closed pretty much around March 16th. So that that was unheard of like the, the as far as the the movie exhibition business or movie theaters like the theatrical window was something the big like regal the amc all the multiplexes and most people sound defended to the death the 90 day window was and that was completely shattered because of this and i have not seen uh, we're seeing some movies like focus features had a, a a drama that played very well in um, Berlin and uh, at Sundance called Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always. And that is just, we were planning to play it. We hope to play it. And it is going straight to video on demand because they have these movies in the, in the lineup and, and they don't, they have no idea when they're going to be able to show them in theaters. And so they're trying to figure out what to do with them. And for me, I love that when, when these distributors have been able to do something that partners with theaters to kind of bring our audiences to them. Um, but I think the real, un, the thing people haven't grappled with yet kind of outside of the industry is two years from now, there's gonna be a big hole in, in the movie schedule when people, all the productions that are currently in, in work right now or were in work that were being written and post-production and and pre-production in shooting that they're going to be, um, you know, just delayed. So, I mean, there's, I, I think not only in the movie industry, but as we've talked about, like the kind of innovations that we've seen in the movie industry, like in every single aspect of people's lives, there's going to be this weird kind of delayed hiccups of this reality that we're living through. We're like, Oh, all these things, the pipelines and all these different industries were like done people. Can, there's only so much you can do, you know, on zoom and remotely and, and, we're going to be seeing that, you know, three years from now, um, still. Do you want to take this next question? Is, I, I might have missed it. it. It should be on, on your... I wonder uh, if it only pops up on ours. Does it only pop up on ours? It's Fave Toshiro Mifune movie. Oh, the, he just turned 100, right? Um, I actually just watched Rashomon again. Uh, he was in that Um so he was Kurosawa's one of you Kurosawa's can't stump Stevens favorites. You can. There's a lot of movie nerds out there, man, that can take take me to the bank. That's for sure. Music is tougher. I'm, I'm better with music than movies, actually. So uh, Soy Felipe, who I, I have a question up from Soy Felipe, also said to say hi to Jimmy and Mary. So there's got to be a connection there. Uh, yeah. What's on What's on your turntable right now? Um, we, you know what. I was listening to, what is that Oklahoma artist? It's, oh, I'm blanking. Well, the girls are just constantly demanding ABBA. So like we have a lot of ABBA on that because of Mamma Mia, like their grandmother took them to see Mamma Mia one and two, which is wildly inappropriate. Like I've come to learn that <laughs> I did not make that decision for my four year old to see Mamma Mia. Um, but uh, so other than that, um, yeah, we're listening to Sturgill Simpson. Um, and actually, weirdly, uh, because we're, we're cooking a lot and there's a lot of us, we've been listening to some classical music, so like uh, some Bach. Um, Look at you. Oh, come on. That's not just a hat rack. This has been really good talking with you. We, if you're open to it, we should have you on more often. Um, I really thought we were going to stump you on some of these questions. Uh, like I didn't know who that person was. The, the last good one was pronunciation, like, oh. though. <laughs> was it? Uh, you're getting some love for the Sturgill Simpson and uh, and your recommendations and your references, um, your good looks, your charm, your wit, uh, <laughs> all of it. Um, 
it's really good to see you, even if it's through a screen. And yeah, yeah. Uh, glad you guys are okay. Um, all our love to your family and to the, the people of Springfield. Oh, thank you so much. It was great to talk to you. I, I appreciate what you're doing, Amy. Miss you guys. And I know. Say hi to Kate and the girls. I will. All right. Adios. Adios. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, Amy, that was Mike Stevens. In case Good you're wondering. Mike. In case you're wondering. So let me um, let me tell you who we've got coming up on Monday. Yeah. So uh, somebody watching says Mike challenged Beto to donut roulette or donut relay, as Cynthia calls it. And I don't know if you know this, but it was the only round of donut roulette that I lost. Was to Mike. Was to Mike, and we were in Liberty. What kind of donut was it? We were in Liberty, Texas. Um, we, I will, Cynthia. I will. Um, we were in um, Liberty, Texas. I don't know if you remember this, Cynthia. And you know the, the way donut roulette or roulette is played. All the people in the car um, have to eat a donut in under sixty seconds, and whoever's it gets to go into the donut shop and select the donut that each person will eat. And so, if if you're playing cutthroat you buy the worst possible donut, yeah. you know, like a blueberry donut with coconut flakes and cocoa puffs sprinkled on top with and whipped cream bacon. and bacon and all that shit. And, um, and of course, you're not going to eat it in under 60 seconds. Or if they do, yeah. then they are a donut roulette master. And so we were playing with Mike and um, Cynthia lost every round. I think he took pity on her. And so selected like a, a, a donut hole for Cynthia. And for me, it was a quadruple size apple fritter that was three days old. And uh, I tried to, you know how competitive I am. I tried to was eat. Was it the size or the, like, the freshness? The it was the age. It was the size. It was the pressure. I was about to, to go, you know, uh, host a town hall in Liberty, Texas. And I was also anxious about trying to do a good job. And it just nearly brought me to my knees and uh, I lost that round. Um, so we'll always remember Mike for that moment. Um, Hopefully for a lot of other moments too. Oh, wow. Let's um, shoot. Uh, okay, we're back. I just want to show you this. Uh, Cynthia was able to find this, this photo. Oh, dang. Cynthia won't let me bring it up. Uh, she found a picture of me with the donuts in Liberty, Texas. Um, oh, well. We'll, we'll, we'll show it next next episode. Okay, we're going to let you guys go. Uh, the beautiful woman in the beautiful dress is Jacqueline, who's going to be our guest on Monday. Um, she is uh, a, a fashion icon in her own right and produces what fashion icons wear uh, in addition Además, and um, you can see that one of a kind Beto dress that, that she's wearing. Uh, when we were at the steak fry in Iowa, which was just a beautiful, amazing day, uh, made even better by Jacqueline's presence. She has turned her skills and her network towards the crisis that healthcare workers face right now. Uh, those healthcare workers who don't have enough personal protective equipment or PPE. Jacqueline is convening, uh, converging all of these um, seamstresses and what's the male version of seamstress, seamstress sewers and people who can provide the material and she's making uh, PPE and getting that out to the world. I think it's called project PPE. Is that right, Cynthia? So um, we're going to have her on. Yeah, it's project PPE. In fact, uh, Cynthia provided me this handy graphic earlier. We really want to hear what she's up to and we want to hear how we can support her because in supporting her, we're supporting those healthcare workers who are on the front lines right now as we try to stop the spread of COVID and save the lives of those who have COVID-19. And we're gonna get an update from LA. And as we said at the start, we've been to all these different cities now, Springfield, Missouri as well. We're gonna have uh, Jacqueline in LA uh, on Monday. We'll also have Veronica Escobar, our hometown Congresswoman, um, and one of the most outstanding reps in the House of Representatives right now. Tell us a little bit about what is in that $2 trillion bill that was signed by the president, passed by the House and the Senate, what that means for small businesses like Mike's, uh, for out-of-work Americans, uh, for healthcare workers. Uh, for any question you have, I want to make she sure she's here uh, to answer it. We'll also have 
uh, reporting from Evanston in Chicago, Illinois, Lisa Delantoni. Um, we're going to have a great week next week. So hope that you'll tune in. As always, 4.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, 5.30 Central, 6.30 Eastern, 3.30 Pacific. Uh, and you're always welcome uh, to join us. So we want you all to have a great weekend. Uh, volunteer at your food bank if you can. Donate to your food bank if you can't. If you need food from your food bank, make sure that you call them and find out when you can go and where to pick it up. Amy, any parting thoughts, words of wisdom? Just have a great weekend. Have a great weekend. All right. We love you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.